it's, it's, it's good to be here with you all. I, um, I've been reading that text all week, and every time I hear it read, it just never seems to get old. And so uh, this is one of those texts that even if you're not familiar with the Bible, you just, you've, heard, you've heard it before. You know, there's, there's texts like the flood of Noah. There's other passages like Jonah and the whale or the fish. The resurrection of Jesus or verses like John 3.16 that um, it's just widely known. And so this passage is like one of those passages, this is among the greats, you know, uh, Daniel chapter three, and I'm, and I'm grateful for the message that it has for us even today. So this story is, uh, is actually remin- reminiscent of the culture in which we live in. And so for me, as I look around, it looks more and more like we are living in a place where we are exiles. And maybe it's just me, but we look less and less like the Christian nation that we were once said to be, with strange gods and strange idols, and it looks a lot like Israel, and feels, I can imagine how it would be like for Israel in Babylon, because it feels like that's where we are in our own country today. And if I'm completely honest, I look around at times, and I, and I know that it seems like our, the one true God, our God, has been defeated. And I know that's not the case. But there's times where it feels like I'm just crying out to God and saying, are you there? What's going on? There's so much evil and wickedness that plagues us. Are you out of control? Of, are you, are you, is, is this that's going on beyond you? And maybe I'm alone, perhaps, but... In my prayer closet, that's what, that's what I do sometimes. The Lord loves to hear from us from where we are. And I know that in this Genesis 3 world that we live in, this, that the, the times where I've cried out to God in the past probably won't be the only times that I will cry out to God in my life. It'll likely happen again. But we have to be re, uh, remembered, or re, remembering, whatever the word is, we have to remember Daniel chapter 2 that we studied last week. Last week, despite the strength of the nations that were represented in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, image, there was a rock that was not cut by human hands that represents the kingdom of God. You guys remember verse 35? They said, this rock that represents the kingdom will one day fill the entire earth. Our God has not been defeated. We have a promise from him. And so, yeah, last week's cosmic truth that Pastor Tony was telling us about is referenced, in, and it's basically saying like, hey, these big truth, this idea that God has not been defeated is here, and now today we're seeing it applied into a particular situation. And so the story this week tells us that God is sovereign, and he is able to deliver his children who refuse to serve other gods. God is able to do this. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he is sovereign and able to deliver his children who refuse to serve other gods, even from a fiery furnace. And so let's go ahead and jump into the text. Let's start in verses 1 through 7, where it sort of gives us a picture of this golden image and the decree that was given. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was 6 cubits, He set it up in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to to, to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the justices, the magistrates, basically everybody. Uh, The list just keeps going on. I'm like, when's it going to stop? And the, the, the officials of the providence to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so in these first verses, if we can pause here for a second, there's this golden image that was put out in a field, and biblical scholars will tell you it's about 90 feet tall. You're talking about cubits, the trans- transferring from cubits to, to feet. But also, they would say it's, it looks similar to us, perhaps like the Washington Monument. So, but at the end of the first verse, it gives us a very important clue to understand the rest of this passage. It says the image was constructed where? In the providence of Babylon. And so if you're a student of the Bible, your ears are probably ringing with the idolatrous tones of Genesis chapter 11. And so in that story, uh, often called the Tower of Babel, the people sought to pursue the things of God without God himself. You see that? 
trying to pursue the things of God without God himself. And so in Daniel chapter 3, we find something very similar. The construction of a statue for worship, but the one true God was eliminated from the equation. And so let's see what verses 4 to 6 say. It says, And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And so the king, of, the king called the royal officials to come and worship when the music sounded. And in a real sense, this was a test of their loyalty to the king. Seeing if they would worship his gods that he has fabricated. And this is not just a test of worship, but this is a test of loyalty. And we see how crazy this is because in verse 7, when the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, and whatever a trigon is, Pastor Tony, we were talking about that <laughs> earlier, uh, when, it, when, that, when the musical instrument was sounded, they actually worshipped. People worshipped. And so think about this. Something that didn't exist but a short time before is constructed. And then you're asked to go and worship it in a field and people actually do it. This is absolutely crazy. This is absolutely crazy. But we do the same thing. We do the exact same thing. And I can imagine there's a couple of reasons why the people out in this field would do this. Some of them could have thought, you know, I don't, wanna, I don't want to lose my social capital, you know, uh, for rebelling against this decree. Some people would say, well, well maybe if I worship, it'll me- be a means of gaining favor with others. And then others could have actually thought that worshiping this idol or this image could actually give them something, peace or fulfillment or joy, purpose. We're in the third decade now of the 20th century. And to go and to think about somebody building a statue in the middle of a field and us coming to worship sounds super archaic, doesn't it? And, but we still do the same thing, as I mentioned before. But ours is so much more subtle, isn't it? The idols we built are so subtle. So it's, our idols, they are, come from what we are told the good life is. The commercials, the, the movies, the sitcoms we watch, uh, you know, they, they tell us what we should be aspiring to, what should give us uh, purpose and our passions to be set on. And so our entertainment is not passive, beloved. It's teaching us something. We are taught what should give us significance, and we're taught to make good things ultimate things, and we're crushed when those things don't give us what we hoped they would give us. You see how that progression works? We make good things ultimate things, and when those things don't deliver on what we hope for them to give us, we are crushed by it. And so how do we understand what an idol is? How do we understand what we've made into an idol? Well, watch this. This is, again, so subtle. And a friend of mine reminded me of this just a couple weeks ago. We are disproportionately frustrated when something doesn't give us what we hoped for. What disproportionately frustrates you? What causes you so much anxiety when it doesn't do exactly what you hoped for? It doesn't give you what you wanted. What happens at, on your job? What happens when your children don't do exactly what you hope for them to do? They don't give you the joy you expected, idol alert. What happens when sex and relationships and other things that you have given all these expectations to don't give you exactly what you wanted? This is the litmus test. This is the question for us to continue to ask and answer for ourselves. And so let's continue in the story. And so in verse 8, we see the accusation against these uh, young Hebrew boys. So, therefore, at the, the time, or at a certain, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every other kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into 
a, a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed, see now they're snitching, over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, say, I don't know, these guys. <laughs> these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So a little bit of backstory to help us kind of uh, get uh, up to speed. Daniel and his friends were given leadership positions. Uh, and, and some of the native Babylonian astrologers, as it says in some translations, these Chaldeans, as we read in the text, they, they, were, they were a little bit jealous. So they offer the king this customary greeting, O king, live forever. And that customary greeting does something for us. It lets the king know that we're your guys. We do what's expected of us. But then, but then they said, but what's expected of us is not what these guys are doing. They're the ones who are not doing what they should be doing. And so this idea of being maliciously accused, that language there in the ESV translation, it can literally be translated, they ate them to pieces. Or they ate the pieces of them, which in our modern vernacular, we can say they ate them for lunch. They're trying to not just take them down, but to destroy them. Has anybody identified with this in your life? When, when your faith is not somebody else's, they're not just out to take you down, but they're out to destroy you. And so these native astrologers, they reported these half-truths to the king, and so now, as my auntie say, they, they, they're starting to lie on them. These half-truths. So you know, they said, hey, they don't, they don't follow you at all, but they don't pay you any attention. Well, this is untrue because they actually showed up where they were supposed to show up, but when the instruments were played, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They didn't worship. They chose not to violate, ex, violate Exodus 20, verse 3, that says, you shall have no other gods before me. So this partial rebellion that Pastor, is, is similar to what Pastor Tony mentioned last week about the, the shrewdness of living in the world as an exile, but not being of it. You guys remember that? The boys uh, showed up, but which they didn't, they didn't violate their consciousness because they, they showed up, but then when it was time to worship, they said, we can't go there. And so this is, this is what it means to live in this world, but not be of it. So this, this scene is indicative for us, uh, is, is uh, instructive for us increasingly. I think we live in a context now where there's authorities of various kinds, People, uh, there's authorities that value things of God. There's authorities who don't. But the fact of the matter is, is that we can live in this world and not be of it. They showed up, but they didn't bow their knee. We have to be able to sift through the things that we're hearing very well, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, and not violate the word of God. So now, in the current moment, we have so many opportunities to exercise this kind of shrewdness. We have, you know, uh, on the job, sometimes there might be ethical things that we might be asked to do that uh, the, the, the Bible uh, stops us from doing. As we are, you know, sending our kids to public school, for those who do, like, th there, there might be things that are taught. We have to say, yes, we can go with this, but we can't do that. We're, you know, th we're always doing this sifting work. In the midst of this pandemic, we've had so many opportunities where we've had to sift through the things that our leaders are saying. As we are engaging in politics, we have to have this kind of discernment, thinking through these things very carefully. But now as we look back to the storyline, Nebuchadnezzar sends for these three leaders, and he gives them another chance to worship this image that he set up. And so look at uh, verses 13 to 18. We'll just sort of work through them verse by verse. And here we see these three teenagers, and they encounter the king. And so they're questioned in verse 13, and then they're, 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 they're wondering why they neglected to worship this God. And so Nebuchadnezzar asked them in verse 14, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? And so when Nebuchadnezzar asks, is it true, the king uh, seems that he's not trusting their accusers, you know, outright. He knows that there's professional jealousy is going on. He knows that there's a bunch of stuff happening uh, amid that group. So he says, you know what, I'm going to give you a second chance. 
I'm going to bring you in, and then I'm going to have them play again, and I'm going to see if you're going to be loyal to me above all. So the orchestra plays again, and then we see what happens. We see that uh, they refuse to bow down to this, uh, this idol. And in verse 15, he gives them another chance. So the orchestra plays again, and the three of them, uh, they don't bow. So I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's uh, just disposition here. The king asks them in verse 15, And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? If you're thrown into the fire, who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Is, verse, is the, the, the major question in verse 15. And in verse 16, I love their answer. The response that says, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. <laughs> These, these boys are talking to the king, remember this. And what do they mean by that? They mean your authority has crossed the line. You are veering into space that is the jurisdiction of God. You are not God. And so he's, he's saying, stay in your place. And so I could imagine if we were watching a contemporary sitcom, you know how they have those cutaway moments? There's like a narrative and you cut away and it's like Meshach in the corner, a light over him, and he's like, hey, yeah, we came out to the field, and, you know, uh, as we were supposed to, but then the music played, and everybody started worshiping, and we couldn't do that, because we already have a God. Yahweh is our God, not the thing that they constructed out there, and so then it comes back to the main uh, sort of line, of, or the, the main show, and then in verse 17, they finally answer the question that Nebuchadnezzar raised in verse 15. Remember the question? And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? They said, if it be so, our God we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. And then in verse 18 it says, but if not, but if not, if God doesn't deliver us from the fiery furnace. And then so, just, 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 just real quick here, they're not pulling back right now. They're not reneging on what they said. They're not, you know, they do believe that God is able to save them, but what they're not sure of is God's will in this particular instance. They serve a God who is able, but they're, not, they're unsure about how he is going to interact with them in this moment. And so this actually makes their obedience more impressive. They are simply obeying God because that's the right thing to do. That's the glorifying to, uh, thing to do to God. They're not trying to obey to bind the conscience of God of, or bind his hand or force him to do something that they wanted. They're saying, we're, gonna, we're not going to uh, violate our conscience. We're not going to worship this, this, uh, you know, this image that you set up. We are going to worship the Lord. And come what may. Come what may. And so as I've read this story over and over again, we're kind of in this moment of uncertainty. You guys, you guys sense that? We have the king who is trying to lay down the law, giving him a second chance. Then we are, you know, you have the, the, the God's people who are saying, we will not bow our knee to anybody but the Lord. And so come what may. And so for, for many of you guys, it seems that there is some uncertainty in your life. For, for many of us, there's suffering of various kinds. As the elders, we, we pray for you all often. And we see the prayer requests come through, and we know that there are some things that are going on in this church that are very, very tough. Actually, not just some, there's a lot. And so you might be in a place of uncertainty. And I, I, I know that you might be uh, just struggling to even hear this sermon or struggling to just be here without your mind racing and wondering, is God going to show up in my situation? That might be your question. God is able, yes he is, but what will God do in this particular situation? We feel so uncertain. Is God powerful enough to deal with it? Yes. Is God able to deliver believers from our trials and problems? He can. But does God deliver believers from all trials? No. At least not now. But he ultimately will. This slight and momentary affliction could, uh, could hit us right now, but it won't be forever. 
God may allow some trials in your life. God may allow trials in the lives of people, perhaps to build our character, perhaps to show people how we uh, suffer with hope. People who are hopeless are trying to grope around and looking for something that they can grab onto, but if they see somebody suffering with hope, how do you do that? I'm not sure why God hasn't lifted that thing from you, but one thing I know is that I hope and pray that as we go through times of difficulty, we can say with Job, though he slay me, I will hope in him. God doesn't guarantee that his followers won't suffer or experience death. But he does promise that he will always be with us. And so if we think about this, God did not exempt himself from difficulty. God did not exempt himself from struggle. God is God but then he entered into time and space to become the man of sorrows. You see that? For the purpose that we wouldn't have to live with sorrow for eternity. And so even God himself is not exempt from that. And so we see the apostle Paul, he sort of echoes what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's statement in Philippians 1, chapter 21, and he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Throw me into the fire and I die. Oh, I'll go be with, with the Lord. But if the Lord actually saves us because he's able, then you'll see a miracle. Do what you're going to do, Neb. (laughs) Give me your best shot. And so as I think about these six verses, uh, you know, there's a couple points of application I'm going to pause and give us real quick. The first thing is God is worthy of our trust in the midst of uncertain times. When you're waiting for the test result. When you're staring down the street wondering if that child is going to come home. When you're wondering what the diagnosis is, when you're, when you're trying to figure out is a person going to come off the ventilator or not, God is worthy of our trust in the midst of uncertainty. Also, secondly, it's important for us to make up our mind where we stand beforehand. We have to make up, uh, you know, uh, make up your mind about where you stand beforehand. So, you know, it's not like Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got in front of the king as these teenagers, you know, and they were making up their minds what they were going to say as they were standing there, you know? They made up their mind beforehand. And the third point here is that they didn't stand alone, they stood in a little community. That's so important for us. Because, I mean, just imagine these three Hebrew boys standing in front of one of the most powerful people in the whole world. And so what they didn't do is bow the knee. What they didn't do is sell out their God. But that didn't mean they weren't trembling in their boots. That didn't mean they just stood there strong and like as they do in the movies and stuff like that. You know, like the, you know, I was talking to Donnie between the services, like the, in the Fox Book of the Martyrs, you know, it's, it's as if these people are unshakable. That's not necessarily the case. They stood there with each other, arm in arm not bowing down to the God that they've created out there in the field. So God is worthy of our trust in the midst of uncertainty. We have to make up our mind where we stand and then stand together as brothers and sisters in community. So important for us. And so after these young men's response, here's the little kingly tantrum that Nebuchadnezzar had. Verse 19. And then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, And they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king ordered the urgent, uh, because the king's order was urgent, and the furnace overheated, the flame of fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the fiery furnace. So this is a tantrum of all tantrums. He wants the the it heated five or seven or seven times more. And they weren't sitting there waiting with thermometers. What they were trying to say is that because seven is the number of completion, he wanted it to be as uh, hot as they can possibly make it. Stoke the thing like you've never stoked that flame before. 
And the haste is also evident as we read in verse 20, because the men were bound in their cloaks, tunics, hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the fire. We have to understand that oftentimes they would strip people of their garments and they would reuse them somewhere else. And that's even of the most poor people who were burned. But these are the king's men. They, they had the, that, that nice drip. You know, they had the good stuff. I'm like, hey, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me have those shoes. <laughs> you know, but, but the king was in, so they would do it to save money and stuff. But anyway, I digress. But he was in such haste that they just threw him bound up, even with all their valuables, that the king himself probably gave them into the furnace. And so let, let's see what happens in uh, the, these next couple of verses, 24 and following. And so these are the climactic verses of this passage. It says, Then uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking amidst uh, in, in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. <laughs> God showed up. The most significant question that we see uh, in, in these verses is that who is that fourth man? Who showed up in the fire with him? And so some people might say it's an angelic being. Of late, a lot of people said that it's the, the pre-incarnate Christ because of a, you know, a Christophany, this appearance of Christ in the Old Testament to Old Testament saints. And so, uh, you know, and th there's a lot of reasons for that. In the KJV, I actually gave a note that said, hey, this is a, you know, the Son of God, which pointed people to uh, think of that person as being Christ himself. And so, you know, I, I, I'm like, okay, I see you. But at the same time, I, I think that if it was going to be, you know, a Christophany, that we would read about it elsewhere, referenced as elsewhere. And so I think it was an angel of the Lord. However, this angel of the Lord doesn't discount the fact that God, and even, you know, through Christ, is being revealed in some ways in this story. So, for example, the angel represented God's presence to his people in this, in this fiery furnace. And Jesus represents God's presence with his people as well. Being the son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, you see? And then also the angel saved his friends from the burning, fiery furnace. But we also see that Christ saves us from the eternal furnace of fire as well. So what we're seeing is that biblical scholars and theologians, they're saying that this is a type of Christ. This is a, a pointer to the activity of Jesus. This is a precursor to get us in the frame of mind to understand what Christ is going to do for us. He shows up. And so for those of you who are in uncertain times, God is showing up. You can, you can bank on that. So just like these boys did in this story, you can bank on two truths, at least, when you are in these moments. God is present, and he loves you. When you can't remember the entire sermon that was preached, when you can't remember the verses that you've memorized, when, you're, when, you're tear, when your eyes are full of tears and you can't see the pages of your Bible, remember, God is present, and he loves you. Verse 27, and the satraps and the prefects, the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and they saw that the fire had not had, not had any power over the bodies of these men. My goodness. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And there was no smell of fire that had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who, test, who trusted him and set aside the king's command and yielded their bodies rather than serve and worship. Uh, and worship, I can't even read you, I'm in tears. <laughs> Any God except their own God. This is good. God meets us. 
And perhaps we could have had a hint in, in, in Daniel chapter 1 when we read the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because Shadrach, Hananiah means that the Lord shows grace. Meshach, Mishael means, you know, who is what God is. And Abednego, Azariah means the Lord is my help. Let's look at verse 39 or 29. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruin. I mean, that's a little bit of overreaction, Nebuchadnezzar, but okay. <laughs> For there, are no other, there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. That's true, though. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So remember, verse 1, it says this all took place in Babylon. Verse 30, it says, you know, they were in the province of Babylon. This Babylon idea is very intentional. The consequences of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11 are, is that they were scattered across the face of the whole earth. And they were speaking new languages now. And throughout the biblical story, especially in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, it's, you know, there's this ingathering of people and they're hearing the word taught and they're all hearing it in their own languages. And so God is going to undo what was done at Genesis chapter, in Genesis chapter 11. You guys see that? And so if we look at what is trying to go on in Daniel chapter 3 in verse 4 of this story, it says the king commands the people from the peoples, the nations, and the languages to worship. But worship what? A false god. This is false worship. This is not what God is doing. But one day, there will be a time where God will bring all of his people together. All of his children, people from every tribe, tongue, people, and languages, and we will be worshiping the God who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The God who kept their garments from being sins is the same God who's going to wash our garments white with the blood of the Lamb. This is who is worthy of our worship. This is the God who's able to deliver. The same God that we see at work here is at work today. God is there. He is present with you. Does God always take us around the, the hardship we see here? Not always. But is God with you in it? You betcha. So who or what are we looking to to deliver us or to distract us while we're in the fire? Behold, that is your God. Whatever that thing is that you're looking to, to help you in, in the midst of the moment that you should be looking to Christ, that's your idol that we're talking about. Those subtle things that creep in, that we try to look to them to do what they're incapable of doing. That, those are the things we have to diagnose, dissect, and say, why are those capturing me so much when I should be looking at Jesus? Because Jesus actually does fulfill what that thing you're, you're hoping to find in your idol. I hope that made sense. Christ is better so for those of you who are unbelievers, and you read a story or hear a story like this, what in the world can give you such an unshakable commitment? What is out there that can give you such an unshakable commitment? I think Martin Luther King Jr. was helpful here. He says, life isn't worth living until you've found something worth dying for. So have you found something worth dying for and then therefore living for? Is there something that we can look to in this life beyond simple self-preservation? Beyond just being, you know, that something that's greater than ourselves? Well, in this passage, we see it. There is a God whose ways are higher and greater than ours. There's a kingdom that's coming that's going to fill the whole earth. And it's that king that we should serve. It's that king who's worthy of our worship, not the idols of this world that continually, continually disappoint us. For those who are Christians, what is your time or what is your response when you're in desperation? What do you look to when your alarm clock goes off tomorrow and you're faced with a day of trials and pressure and stress? What do you look to to help relieve that, to distract you? If it's not Christ, it's idolatry. Look to Jesus. While he won't always keep you out of the fire in this life, he'll be with you while you're in it. 
And so thank God for this wonderful gift, which is himself. So let us take stock of our idols this week. Determine where we look in vain for help this week. And remember that Christ is the answer. For those who are holding this yoke that is crushing you of guilt, of sin, of shame, there is one who is here to take it off of you. And it's Christ who took on all that stuff if you let him, died on the Christ and exchanged his righteousness, his goodness, his, you know, for all your junk. Jesus will be there for you. You don't have to have an idol that's going to fail you. We have a God who has been present and has made good on his promises over and over and over again. He's present and he loves us. Thank God for his word this morning. Let's pray. God, you are so good to, to us. Father, we thank you for how you've continually shown us that you are at work in this world. And ultimately, you rule and you reign. And we say thank you. Thank you for including us in your plan. Thank you for showing us grace when we've been faithless. Thank you for being patient with us when we've shown nothing but impatience. God, you are better to us than we could be to ourselves. So we thank you for that this morning. Thank you for giving us your word, not leaving us without a witness to who you are. I'm grateful for my brothers and sisters today that we've uh, been able to open your word and seek your face. We we're, we're those who have faith seeking understanding, God. We thank you for meeting us here as you met those boys in that fiery furnace. And God, you are our hope. Sometimes we're prone to look at idols. Sometimes we're prone to look to distractions. But God, I pray that we look to you this week when the pressure mounts, when uncertainty is on the horizon. God, we thank you for who you are and all that you're doing, even now. And we pray all this in your name. Amen.